morning. Welcome to Independent Methodist Church. Today is Sunday, the 13th of September, 2020. On this weekend, we are observing our 32nd anniversary as a congregation. The church was established on 9-11 of 1988 at the Roger de Carbo Chapel in Newcastle. There were 267 in attendance. Participating in the recorded service are harpist Jingyi Jang, her son Emmanuel Cho on the violin, Sherry Donnelly as the lector, the video photographer is Shane Donnelly. The Missions and Benevolence Committee will meet Tuesday at 6 p.m. and the church council at 7. A letter will go out to the congregation on Tuesday morning. It is good that you are with us. I do want to remind you that we have a memorization contest going on and you have the options of learning the Lord's Prayer, the 23rd Psalm, the books of the Bible, or the Apostles' Creed. And I have a sheet to give you with the text for all four of them so we have the same words that we are committing to memorization. But for the past few weeks we have been looking at foods which have a Christian message. And one thing that I'm going to share with you, and I almost guarantee that you have enjoyed them at some time, a graham cracker. And a graham cracker is named for a reverend, a, a pastor of a church. And he lived well over a hundred years ago, and his name was Sylvester Graham. 
He was a Presbyterian, and he was a Native American. And he came from a large family, and he believed that God wants all people to be healthy, and that we need to take care of our body. And one way that we can take care of our body is proper nutrition. And that he was looking at how people were eating, and he just felt, I really don't think that this is what God wants for us. And what he encouraged is that people not eat meat. And Sylvester Graham is often called the father of vegetarianism. Now what vegetarianism means, that people eat only fruit and vegetables and grains and nuts. They do not eat meat. All right, so that means that you can't have a, a taco, you can't have KFC chicken, you can't have a hot dog, all right? And this is called vegetarianism. Now, it might surprise you to learn at one time, everybody in the world was a vegetarian. And when God created Adam and Eve, and their children and grandchildren and all the people that lived in the world at the very beginning, you were only permitted to eat fruits and vegetables and grain. No meat, okay? But then God made a change. And if we know the story of Noah and the ark, for 40 days it rained and the earth was destroyed and Noah and the people with him and the animals left the boat and God put a big rainbow in the sky and God made a promise that the earth would never be destroyed again by a flood. But he also made different promises and gave different allowances to the human family. And for the first time, humans were allowed to eat meat. All right, so it all goes back to Noah. Now the Bible says that we are permitted to eat meat. We don't have to. If you don't, if you don't want to eat meat, that is okay. And this was the thinking of Sylvester Graham, and many people started thinking like him. And they came out with a wheat made from whole grain, from which we make graham crackers. And this is what graham crackers look like a century ago. And they have been around for a long time, and the house of this Sylvester Graham is a museum. And in Connecticut, you can see the old house where he lived. And he lived a very simple life. And then later the house is made into a museum. And also it's a bread and breakfast. So the museum in Connecticut. So he traveled across America promoting vegetarianism and this uh, sweetened flour substitute, and that caught on. And of course, from graham flour, we make pie crust. You have golden graham cereal. And one thing I imagine that you're gonna do with a box of graham crackers, you're gonna make a s'more. So each one of you, if you were here, you are going to receive a box of graham crackers, and we owe this to a, a reverend, a pastor of a church who had a belief in proper nutrition and promoted a wheat that, that tastes pretty good, and it has been around for a long time. So you go out and enjoy your graham crackers, and have a good day. The Word of God is found in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. I am reading from Eugene Peterson's The Message, the letter to the Church of Philadelphia. Write this to Philadelphia, to the angel of the church, the holy, the true, David's key in his hand, opening doors no one can lock and locking doors no one can open, speaks. I see what you've done. Now see what I've done. I've opened a door before you that no one can slam shut. You don't have much strength. I know that. 
You used what you had to keep my word. You didn't deny me when times were rough. And watch as I take those who call themselves true believers, but are nothing of the kind. Pretenders whose true membership is in the club of Satan. Watch as I strip off, off their pretensions and they're forced to acknowledge it's you that I've loved. Because you've kept my word in passionate patience, I'll keep you safe in the time of testing that will be here soon. And all over the earth, every man, woman, and child put to the test. I'm on my way. I'll be there soon. Keep a tight grip on what you have so no one distracts you and steals your crown. I'll make each conqueror a pillar in the sanctuary of my God, a permanent position of honor. Then I'll write names on you, the pillars, the name of God, the name of God's city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, and my new name. Are your ears awake? Listen, listen to the wind words, the spirit blowing through the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Everyone is worried about the economy. Hey, my hairline is in recession. My waistline is in inflation. And altogether, I am in depression. There is much discussion in the media about the devastation impacting the commercial sector because of the pandemic. Lesser known is the widespread mood of melancholy in church world. The Barner Research Institute is a scientific survey polling organization of religious data. Two weeks ago, it released its projection. Within the next 18 months, one in four churches in the nation will be forced to permanently shut down due to the hardships by the global pestilence. Others will have to merge for financial sustainability and still others will be adopted as a satellite campus for a mega church. The de-churching of America has been going on for some time. The coronavirus has accelerated this decline in organized religion. Lacking sufficient fiscal reserves and witnessing a dramatic loss of weekly income due to the quarantine, congregations find themselves no longer solvent and must quit operation. Churches of all denominations and sizes face this crisis. The super duper churches dotting the landscape in the suburban sprawl may be heavily mortgaged, generate a high overhead, and target a constituency undergoing considerable unemployment. And if able to come through these difficult days, the large church must now trim its budget, reduce its staff, and suspend its broad platform of activities and programs, thereby lessening its appeal. Let us keep in mind, in some states, churches are forbidden to sponsor indoor services or gatherings of more than 25, and are in the seventh month of governmental restriction. Added to this, is the dismal announcement by Tom Rayner, a well-known researcher of facts and figures charting trends for ecclesiastical bodies, two weeks ago submitted an alarming article, Six Reasons Your Pastor Is About to Quit. According to Rayner, the pandemic has taken a toll on clergy with weariness, in-house fighting, defections, unfair criticisms, increased workload, and financial insecurity, with many about the jump ship. This upsetting forecast by Rayner concludes, burned out, beaten up, downtrodden. Many are about to quit. You may be surprised to discover 
your pastor is among them. In a parish, a minister had been installed as the new pastor. After the installation service, a five-year-old came up to the preacher man and inquired, Reverend, how does it feel since you have been pasteurized? Not only has this pastor been pasteurized, the reverend has been revved up by laying claim to a promise issued by Christ himself in Revelation 3.10. Because you have kept my command that persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Let me make it perfectly clear. I do not have the faintest notion of leaving my post at Independent Methodist Church. For a chap my age, I am in pretty good health, and I know that my physical condition can abruptly change overnight. I am grateful for my status. Also due to the tender mercies and loving kindnesses by Almighty God, the people and pastor have been exempt from the decimation of the dreaded disease. The faithful stewardship of this people of God has enabled independent Methodist to meet all of its monetary obligations and confronts no unpaid debt. This church has returned to all of its pre-pandemic weekly schedule of events, except for nursery care at Sunday worship and the children's class in the Sunday school. I will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world. The book of Revelation opens with seven letters dispatched to the churches of Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. Each is likened to a light on a menorah. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These letters are earmarked to the angel of each church. Some commentators teach that the angel is the pastor, for angel means messenger. But the viewpoint I find accepting is that the angel is an angel, one of God's invisible secret agents. Just as an individual has his or her personal guardian angel, the Lord assigns a patron angel to every community of faith. Due to the protective presence of the supernatural agency of a celestial spirit and his 24-7 vigilant eye over us, the place, people, and pastor have been safeguarded during the epidemic. I hold membership in the Triple A, angels always attending. And some scholars understand that the seven churches of Revelation stand for successive time periods stretching from the apostolic age until the second advent. Other interpreters say that every church, past, present, and future, is a conflation of the seven. We are like Ephesus. We have lost our first love, and we reveal ourselves to be Laodicea, neither hot or cold, but lukewarm, and so on. At another perspective, the seven stand for different classifications of congregations. A church family is a Thyatira. It tolerates a Jezebel spirit, or a Sardis, a funeral waiting to happen. For previous anniversary services, and again today, I connect with the Church of Philadelphia as our model. The Church 
of the open door. The reigning, exalted, and returning Jesus Christ prefaced his letter to Philadelphia, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. If you affirm, as I do, the Word of God teaches Jesus Christ is sovereign over all things. This leads us to conclude that the pandemic is under his governance, and that the closure, reopening, and permanent dissolution of churches is either his intentional or permissive ultimate will. For us to be enabled to reopen, our restart should be embraced as a time of refreshment. Our survival is not simply a return to the normal. Our relaunching affords us an opportunity to thrive. Circumstances dictated that I make entry into the newfangled technology of the internet. Palm Sunday, the 5th of April, was a quantum leap. A pre-recorded service was introduced and has continued weekly for six months. 436 units of viewership have watched the first service. This does not mean 436 individuals, but households likely comprise of more than one person. Also, if someone returned to the site, he was not counted for a second time. Our weekly online audience averages around 100. The majority consists of congregants living outside Newcastle, friends of the church scattered across the land, and kith and kin of the membership. I have knowledge that our services have been seen in nine states, plus the East African country of Kenya, and I learned a short while ago on the island of Taiwan. Without the COVID-19 lockdown, Independent Methodist Church may not have advanced to take the challenge for the new means of ministry. A closed church door resulted in open windows. And the plan is for us to continue to provide both online and in-person weekend worship. Why is the Lord continually opening and closing doors in our personal life and in the life of the church? Maybe that prevent us from making mistakes, to reroute us to take the right path, and to test our faith and to produce patience. We are always in a hurry, he is not. Inventor Alexander Graham Bell made the evaluation, when one door closes, another opens but we often look so long and so regretfully upon the closed door that we do not see the one which has opened for us. Having crossed the threshold into YouTube and Facebook, I am very pleased with this new venture. It is the Lord's doing, and the ways and the means came together by a flow of the Spirit. A gospel singing group was in concert at a country church in Appalachia. While singing, the deacons started passing out rattlesnakes for the assembly to dance with during the music. Terrified, the lead singer looked over and said, Pastor, where is the back door? We don't have a back door. Well, where would you like me to make one? and the quartet was out of there in no time. And has it not been the inducement of the world 
the flesh and the devil, the great serpent, for the fag-driven church of what's happening now to lead us down the path that we can make an impact for Christ with Elvis impersonators belting out gospel tunes, tattoo parlors offering free religious body art, food courts with cappuccino bars and Krispy Kreme counters, Bible conferences on Caribbean cruise lines and jungle gyms for kids. A way out, let my people a go-go discotheque worship center with empty pews and no future funding locked its doors for good. Hanging a sign at its main entrance, gone out of business. A self-styled modern day prophet wrote graffiti beneath, gone out of business because you didn't know what your business was. Of the seven churches in Revelation, the Lord Jesus Christ made inventory of what he approved and disapproved, condemned and commended, the pluses and the minuses. Only two, the master found no fault, Smyrna and Philadelphia. Imagine any church which gets a five-star rating by the Son of God. And what is amazing, both Smyrna and Philadelphia were small, not big churches. The Lord turns the human criteria for measuring success on its head. Christ does not esteem the amount of the collection the size of the membership, the statistics of attendance, the educational attainment of the preacher, or the beauty of the edifice. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. For too long, churches, peoples in the pew, leadership and pastors have prompted an easy believism the prosperity gospel, bipartisan political alignment, moral relativism, and sexual permissiveness. The doctrines of the supremacy and centrality of Christ, the sufficiency of his blood sacrifice, salvation through Christ alone, hell, judgment, the wrath of God, and the inspiration and the authority of the scriptures have been de-emphasized, ignored, and discarded by the pulpit. Radio Bible teacher John MacArthur tells it like it is, with his estimation, anyone who claims to be called to ministry has to realize that he is God's messenger only as long as he gives the Lord's message. Youngsters were to put on a program in church, all lined up, and to come marching down the aisle singing Onward Christian Soldiers. A boy wanted to lead the procession and carry a cross. The music director dismissed the idea and set the cross behind the door in the portal room. The kids didn't like it, so they stirred a protest. Onward Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus locked behind the door. And I don't blame them. Too often we have minimized and marginalized our faith in Christ crucified, risen, and coming again. And this message is to be broadcast clearly widely and creatively. Earlier this year, as I was about to enter my auto, I was greeted on the parking lot by a man on a motorcycle, informing me that he had purchased commercial real estate on the road, and that he made an investigation, and on a typical day, over 14,000 vehicles 
go up and down New Butler Road. With that amount of traffic, he was tinkering with several different business ventures. If independent Methodist Church were to be gone for good and cease to exist, what things would the motorist most miss about us? What would the community most miss about us? And the answer is the outdoor Christmas and Easter decorations with the electrified signs, Christ is born, Christ is risen. When the carpet cleaners were in this room several weeks ago, they brought to my attention and conversation how much they have enjoyed our displays. Late at night, cars pull up onto the parking lot and take photographs. People have prayed at the Nativity. Two businessmen from Italy were driving by and said that in their country for Holy Week, there are large outdoor religious scenes in evidence everywhere, but they had never seen anything like this in the USA. Making videos of our decorations, they were going to be home for Easter and planned to share the exhibits with their families. Each church has a distinctive, unique function to perform to be a blessing to the family of God. We are a blessing. Rick Warren, author of The Purpose Driven Life, made the observation, small churches become more effective when they specialize in what they do best. Keeping Christ in Christmas we do best, and it is of paramount importance. And he, there is no way that you can walk into this building or drive by this structure in December without a recognition for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and he shall be called the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And with attention to Bible-based preaching and teaching, augmented by ripened rabbinic learning, the writings of the ancient church fathers, medieval saints, Protestant theologians, and modern scholarship, and a focus on fine music and the arts, plus gracious hospitality, Independent Methodist Church has sought to become a community with little strength, but having kept Christ's word, nor denying his name. Our slogan could well be that of the ministry of Billy Graham, geared to the times, anchored to the rock of ages. Outside our door, is a vast number of the unsaved, the unchurched, and the unregenerate. People who need Christ and a promise of heaven. They also need to be able to endure and to pass through these difficult days with faith and optimism. And they need to know the right from the wrong and that pursue a life well-pleasing well unto the Lord. Hal Lindsey, author of The Late Great Planet Earth, made the statement, we can go about 40 days without food, about three days without water, about eight minutes without air, but only one second without hope. Our hope is in Christ. Margaret Maggie Tobin Brown was a socialite, philanthropist, and early woman's activist, finding herself on the maiden voyage of the Titanic. This outspoken high society lady took charge of the crisis, evacuating women and children to board the lifeboats, finding herself on lifeboat number six, and hearing men 
crying out in the darkness in the frozen waters of the Atlantic, this woman rode the lifeboat to fetch these chaps from drowning. Immortalized in a Broadway musical and a movie, Margaret Maggie Tobin Brown is better known as the unsinkable Molly Brown. Molly believed in the sacredness of life. Each one reach one. Are we involved in rescue operations? Christ issued a guarantee to the church in Philadelphia. I will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Then it says, Behold, I come quickly. How many believe we are living in the last days? The out of control forest fires raging in three states, unprecedented topsy turvy weather, heat waves, earthquakes, famine, locust plague increase in violence and wickedness all point to the fulfillment of Scripture. The late Adrian Rogers, president of a Southern Baptist Convention, said, when everything is coming undone, the world is caught up in turmoil. There are three categories of people, those who are afraid, those who don't know enough to be afraid, and those who know their Bible. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When will we realize He's the open door? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, you built your church upon the rock, that even the gates of hell might not prevail against it. Have mercy on the churches of this land, and especially upon our own independent Methodist church. Make the worship of your people acceptable in your sight. Sweeten our fellowship with brotherly love, and unite us in a continuous, bold, and effective witness to our community for the spread of your kingdom and the glory of your name. Amen. The unison prayer. Lord of the church, enable your people to be the church, a redeemed people, a holy people, a united people, a missionary people, and in all things, a people gladly submissive to the truth you have shown upon us in yourself. Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen.